So without further ado, I'm going to hand you over to Anna Robertson from SAOS. Great, thanks very much, Kerry. Um, thanks for the introduction and for uh, having us all here tonight. Um, so just as you said, Kerry, tonight we're going to have a bit of an um, informal chat about informal cooperation, how it works, what the benefits are, and hear firsthand from Hector and Caroline on their experience about how cooperation has worked for them and their businesses. I'm sure a lot of us cooperate informally already. We probably just don't recognize that we're actually doing it. And many of us could probably work together far more than we do um, already. So hopefully tonight, um, we can share some examples with you um, about how you might want to work together with your neighbors or family, friends a bit more. Next slide, please. So just as a quick introduction to SEOS, um, we are Scotland's experts on farmer co-ops and food industry collaboration. We are a membership owned organisation and support over 60 co-ops across Scotland who are our members, they, they govern what we do um, across, as you can see, a really wide range of sectors, everything from mussels to peas and venison to arable co-ops. So a really wide um, selection of member owned businesses right here in Scotland. Next slide, please. So let's just get straight into it. Um, there are a number of forms of um, cooperation and benefits as you can see in the slide. I'm not gonna go through um, every single um, type of cooperation that we have here on the slide, but um, you can see from the detail that, that we've got that immediately there are so many benefits of working together, right from sharing resources. So that's what we're looking at tonight through neighboring and um, joint ventures um, and how that can help you reduce your fixed costs. Um, for example, right up to your sort of supply marketing um, uh, co-ops at, at the other end. So from independent research, um, we estimated that around 57% of Scottish farms are already involved in some type of cooperation. And that breaks down into around 22% um, informal cooperation, so that's neighbouring and joint ventures and around 35% um, of farms are part of uh, a co-op, for example, Tayforth Machinery Ring or, um, or Borders Machinery Ring, for example. But we do think that those figures um, underestimate the, the, the amount of informal cooperation that's actually going on on farm. Um, you know, as I said at the beginning, people don't perhaps appreciate that they're actually cooperating already um, with their neighbours. Next slide, please. So to me, informal cooperation is built upon trust, um, whereby two or more businesses um, work together for mutual benefit. And looking into the future, we, we at SUS, we really see um, the industry needing to um, cooperate and work together more. And we would really like to see that increase because there, there is going to be a need. Um, we all know that there's going to be a cut in farm support and at the moment there'll be some farms in Scotland that are struggling to make a sustainable profit without that farm subsidy and um, there's certainly a shortage of labour and skills and and how can we get that can we get that from working with other people with our neighbours and um, you know what do they have that could benefit us and what do we have that can benefit them there are huge changes and challenges ahead, not just in relation to um, farm support. Um, you know, again, as we as we go further down the line, the effects of Brexit, um, you know, the, the COVID recovery plan, how does that affect us as, as farming businesses in Scotland? Many farms now are over mechanized. We'll speak a bit about that in a, in a slide coming up, but it does mean that um, a lot of farms in Scotland now have very high fixed costs. Um, and in order for us to stay um, uh, profitable, you know, how can we again work with other people to reduce those fixed costs and to have more money staying within our business um, than, than um, it going elsewhere. It can help build a community. Um, I think more, uh, more so in the last probably 12 to 18 months, 
it's very easy for um, for farming people to feel um, isolated. Haven't seen many people over the last over the last year, certainly. So um, you know. Informal cooperation allows you to get to know your neighbours a bit better um, and just to be able to go and have that chat with them. Um, so informal cooperation doesn't just have to be about um, sharing resources. It can just be about you know, having that relationship with your next door neighbour. It can help improve health and safety. I think the figures at the moment say that um, one person in the UK a, year, uh, a, a week sorry, um, dies on a farm. Um, you know, having more people with you on farm to help with those tasks, whether it's handling cattle or, um, you know, silage operations to, to allow everyone to feel comfortable in, in the role that they've got and for things to happen as they should, um, it is always going to be a benefit. And finally, it's, it's just a great opportunity. You'll hear from Caroline and Hector um, just shortly, but, you know, great things come out, out from people working together and um, so hopefully, hopefully we can share some more of those um, later on with you. Next slide, please. So why do we do it? What are the benefits? Um, some of which I've already mentioned. It is a route to cut costs. It can help improve timeliness, as we said, with those, for example, silage operation. You know, instead of trying to do things yourself for something taking a bit longer, get someone in to give you a hand, you know, and you can replicate that back for them um, if they need a hand um, for either carting up barley or, or, or such like. Um, it can help make our lives a bit simpler and free up some time. Um, again, it just helps um, tasks get done when they need to be done. And it means that you can then concentrate efforts and resources on something else. It can help cut stress. It might not always, but it can help cut stress. Um, you know, there are times of the year where there are stressful tasks to be had. And um, so if you can get a hand to do them, then, you know, that's brilliant. It can help build communities, just as I said in the last slide, get to know your neighbors better and um, find out, you know, how they can help you and you can help them. It can increase business resilience. And finally, trying to get that work-life balance um, a bit more, a bit more even, and it means that you can get some cover to get away on holidays. Um, I'm not sure how many of us are going to get on holiday this year. Um, it's more likely to be a staycation for a few days, but um, you know, when that time comes that we can all get away again, it's good for someone else to know how your business operates. Um, should there be a need for someone to come in and give you a hand? Next slide, please. So this is, this is kind of a question which um, I ask you, the audience, um, you know, why have we stopped neighbouring so much? Because to be honest, um, myself and colleagues have had conversations about this and we don't always know why people have stopped cooperating so much, why people have stopped working together. Because certainly in the past, it was a necessity. People just had to work together. They didn't have... Um, the big fancy machines which could do more than one job um, and, and you know these machines have now replaced the people who would have done those jobs in the past. The farms are bigger, they're better capitalised, money is easier to borrow which means that those, e those machines are easier to buy and, and people are happier at the moment to undertake those tasks by themselves at the time that they want to do it and not have to work around anyone else's schedule. Those specialised machines are expensive, they require a skilled operator, there may not be as many skilled operators as we need there to be, but um, you know that, that's just what's happening at the moment. And finally, some people might just not know their neighbours as well, you know, where you might have needed that hand in the past, you don't now, don't, don't need that now because we've got all this modern technology which allows us to do a lot more loan working. Next slide, please. So I'm just going to give you a few examples of, um, of informal sort of neighbouring and cooperation and, and as I say, um, Caroline and, and Fergus, uh, sorry, Caroline and Hector are going to tell us a wee bit more in a moment. 
Um, but just a few things for you to have a think about. Um, handling livestock, whether it's shifting sheep or dozing cattle. Um, certainly our farm set up at home at the moment is that um, we're probably one of the few farms that are still able to run cattle along uh, a back road, a small single track road. Um, and for us to be able to do that, we need to get people in to give us a hand. And, um, you know, we're probably going the, the length of nearly a mile, a mile and a half along the road with perhaps 40 cows and young followers um, chasing on behind us, gates to cover, um, forestry entrances to, to fill. And so we ask our neighbours to give us a hand to do that. And, and likewise, we go back and help them when they need a hand, um, whether it's, as I say, shifting sheep or, or handling livestock. Sharing simple bits of kit. Um, another example, I'm just going to give you a few examples from, from what we do at home. Um, sharing simple bits of kit, for example, um, we share a electronic um, cattle uh, weigh head um, for, the, for the weigh scales for the cattle. We don't use it every single day of the year. Um, it works in well with a, a, a close um, farming family. Um, close by to us, when they need it, they come and get it. When we need it, they go and get it. And um, so it, it works out really well. It means that neither of us have to shell out the full cost for something like that. And it's a bit of kit that's not utilized every day of the year. So let's share that and, and both get the benefits from, from having the bit of kit. Moving up a notch slightly, uh, jointly owning a machine. Um, probably a good bit more commitment. Um, for example, whether it's a, a combine or um, a, a grass mower, whatever it might be. Um, it could be a sheep scanner, for example. You know, again, it's a bit of kit that's not used right across the year. Why not share that with someone um, and, and both reap the benefits from it? Shared silage making operations and, and contract um, heifer rearing. You know, these are these are all examples. They're live examples that we know of that are going um, in, uh, going on in and around Scotland. Um, selling weaned calves. Um, another example from us. Um, uh, my partner here, his uh, farming family, um, buy weaned calves from one of their farming um, family friends, and at that point, we then take them through to finishing. So it works well in that they go off to the West Coast, they buy the calves, they take them up to a certain age, and then we buy them from them. Um, they've got all, we've got all the uh, uh, facilities to, to fatten and finish them here. And it works in well that their sheds are then cleaned, cleaned out, and then they can bring in the next um, group of young calves. Benchmarking groups, um, uh, again, you know, that's slightly more commitment you're sharing um, I guess some personal data with, um, with you know neighbours around um, around your county. Buying groups for inputs. I'll leave that to Caroline to speak about later, as will I with the diversified new business and joint farming businesses. Um, next slide, please. So just, just the final slide before um, I pass over to Hector, um, just a wee bit about how to make it a success and things to look out for when you're considering um, you know, starting up a, a relationship in business with a neighbor or farming family friends, for example. The first thing is uh, leadership. Someone has to initiate it. It won't just happen. Um, you know, there are so many benefits to reap from um, uh, cooperating more but someone has to have that first conversation and whether that first conversation is with your neighbour or you pick up the phone um, to myself or one of my colleagues we can talk through that that idea that scenario with you um, and help you start that process start that thinking process as to, to how it might work um, and and what benefits you will you'll all get out of it have a good relationship. It's really important that you work with someone that you trust and that you get on with. Um, I, I can't imagine anything worse than going into business with someone who you, you perhaps don't agree with um, 
the you know their sort of train of thought or how they do things so make sure if you're going to enter into something whether it's just as i say sharing that small piece of um that kit that sheep scanner or you know jointly owning a combine you know it's important that you set these shared objectives those clear goals as to to what you both want to get or however many of you're in the the um the, the, the business proposition together and um, that you all get something out of it and it, that it's fair you know that that's really important that it's fair for everyone and um, it's it's not a one-sided um sort of relationship good open com communications and um, again before you go anywhere near if you're buying something with someone else or you're starting up a relationship in terms of sharing labor or skills get it get it down in writing decide what um decide what you want it to be and if you've got something to say just say it because the chances are the other person's thinking it as well and so if everyone's clear from the start what's going on then um, it will make for a much stronger relationship going forward and again highlight the problem areas there will be problem areas you know who if you share a combine who gets the combine first and you know how how is the the labor um around the the harvest operations allocated out who pays for that you know it's uh, it's important to get that out at the start and for everyone to again start on a fresh sheet of paper and and um, go forward from there seek advice talk to others um anyone that you know that does this already will be able to share their experiences the things that have worked really well and perhaps the things that haven't worked so well and we can learn from that we said get something down in writing that doesn't need to be a legal document it can just be a, you know a piece of paper which sets out an agreement between the parties and again you know it's got those objectives it's got how the, the operation will work how the relationship will work and so if there's any quibbles then you can go back to that and um, go back to that um document and say well this is what we agreed and so you know you you see out that, that agreement for say a year and then you come together at the end of that year and decide what you would like to be done differently and just adapt and change as it needs to um, as it needs to going forward. Next slide, please. So that's really it from me. Um, Caroline and Hector are going to share um, their experiences with you, which will be uh, great um, to hear for the rest of the session. But as I said, you know, if anyone has any um, initial ideas that they would like to run by us, and um, if you want some help setting up those conversations, then please do get in touch because that is absolutely what we're here for. So thank you very much. That's over to you, Hector. Okay. Um, right. Before I start, I would like to just from a user's point of view, say how amazing SOS are. Um, I've had enormous length of time in contact with them in that I think I, I was on the first run uh, to look at machinery rings in Germany led by SOS and um, I've seen them setting up big cooperatives like such as Highland Grain and the machinery rings so we're incredibly lucky in Scotland and, and I think Anna can probably confirm this I have a feeling of all the home nations we're actually the only country that has a, a specific group um, to do with cooperatives and that's absolutely unique and it's been essential I think for the last 40 years of Scottish agriculture but I'm a, a completely I'm completely sold on cooperation always have been ever since as a student in Uist, I, I noticed how all the crofters uh, work together and I came back from there convinced that that's how we should be doing it, but on a bigger scale. So um, next slide, please, Seamus. So a little bit about my history. I returned to the family farm in 1973. It was very much a traditional farm then, 100 um, fattening cattle, 650 ewes maybe 400 acres of cereals, 
and a couple of hundred acres of grass and uh, some woodland and that was about it. Uh, I went through various changes. I got rid of the ewes uh, because they we were losing a lot of them to Yagsiectium pneumonia. Um, I then tried a suckler herd, built that up to 170 uh, suckler cows. Then I couldn't really make that work. Um, it, it, it worked, but it wasn't making me a lot of money. It was keeping several men in job. Um, and then I decided to actually get rid of all the livestock because I sat down and did the figures and realized that a lot, an awful lot of labor was spent on the livestock, whereas the arable side um, tended to be just two peaks of, of um, spring and, and summer. And the rest of the year, there wasn't a lot of labor involved. Um, and by 2000, we had about 350 hectares of arable, 65 hectares of permanent pasture, and 95 hectares of woodland. And at that time, a key employee was due to retire. He had a couple of years left. And our son uh, was about to come home, but he'd trained as a mechanical engineer. And he certainly didn't want to sit on a tractor for 24-7. So he already had his little engineering workshop and engineering business. Um, and I didn't particularly want to train up another man. So, and looking at malting barley margins, they were a bit tight at the time. Our machinery was due for an upgrade. And I just felt that we were in a, a, a position where a big change had to be made. Um, next slide, please. And at that time, I, I certainly knew about Velcourt and Farm Care, which was previously the co-op. And I thought, well, that was maybe a model that might be looked at. But when I investigated, I went down to England, looked at um, both setups, but they were really on a much, much bigger scale than I envisaged. Um, we approached, I think, the co-op finally, uh, but they needed about 1,200 hectares to make it actually work for them and they had nowhere north of Aberdeen so I, I, I put that on hold and I began to talk to, to some of our very close neighbours but nobody was actually ready and I think your business has to be ready uh, for cooperation and neither you know uh, certainly locally I couldn't find anyone who um, really felt they were ready to cooperate. So I then heard of a, a, a farming business who we knew quite well, the family, um, 12 miles away, who had two sons who were, were now at home. And we approached them, or they approached us, I can't always remember how it worked, and we decided to start working together. Uh, and we did that for maybe two, three seasons. And we realized we got on quite well. Both farms sort of fitted together in that they were on the Black Isle, which is earlier than us. We've got fairly heavy soil, so tend to be later. And that's quite important too, when you're thinking of cooperatives, especially in arable, that there is some sort of window where um, maybe one business has an advantage over the other and you play to that uh, advantage. And we decided then to finally um, formalize the whole thing. And with the help of SOS, we formed a limited uh, company called Highland Land Management. And that was incorporated in 2003. And what the model we did was uh, we put all our arable equipment, and that was really the cereal growing equipment, not anything else, uh, and had it valued by two local machinery dealers. So we got an average price. And we then put all that, each family business put that into the limited company as their capital. And having got it into the limited company, we then decided to rationalize it. And obviously we each had seed drills and whatever, and we decided to just scale up, get rid of the, the units that were duplicated like rollers and various things and scale up so that we could deal with the, the increased hectareage and um, both individual businesses held equal shares in that company. We did get a small grant, startup grant from Highlands and Islands Enterprise. And that's something that, again, when you're beginning to cooperate, it's a new business, it's worth investigating if there are any grants out there from your enterprise company or other sources. 
Okay, next slide, please. Um, so how it worked was that from 2003 to 2018, HLM, Highland Land Management, provided a very efficient, cost-effective, arable contracting service. Uh, basically, underneath what happened was that uh, HLM charged each business a contracting rate, and that was set prior to the, the season, usually just before we started ploughing in the autumn. Uh, they paid the labour charges, the machinery repairs, maintenance, insurance, office and professional fees and management. And then post-harvest, usually a rebate on the contracting charges was made. And, and the great thing about this model is that you're, you actually own a contracting business. And whereas if you use contractors, the profit would just disappear into the contracting business. But if you actually own the contracting business, uh, the profits are yours to distribute as you wish. Uh, occasionally, when we're buying big bits of kit, short-term loans from the individual businesses were required. But um, that was really just to ease cash flow. And it was only when we were buying things like combines. And then it was usually repaid quite quickly. Uh, but that was just the model we worked. Okay, next slide. Now, the benefits. Well, again, I can only really speak from our point of view uh, as a family business. And the biggest one was freeing up time. Um, and it allowed us, um, both my son and I, to investigate various diversification uh, interests. It also helped uh, hugely on financial savings in that, uh, Things like, for instance, after our key man retired, for about five years, we employed nobody on this business. And we used, within Highland Land Management, we were using one or two regular employees, but also uh, casuals. And it also meant keeping machinery up to date so that we always had the best of kit. And the work got done on a timely basis, and there were very few breakdowns and so the whole thing worked excellently. Um, and it gave, for me, a better work-life balance. And uh, next slide, please. Now, diversification was the biggest thing and biggest benefit that came to our business. Uh, so about a year after uh, we'd actually incorporated Highland Land Management, a large block of commercial forestry next door to us uh, came up and I've always been keen on woodland and uh, we decided to buy it. Um, so that was a huge uh, diversification for us. Previous to that, we'd had 95 hectares of pretty scruffy woodland just in amongst fields and things that we weren't really bothered with. But this investment uh, was really quite major. And uh, Sod's Law, 2006, four, two years later, a next door neighbouring farm came up for sale. And having just invested in the forestry, I, I was pretty tight for cash and I didn't see my chance of, of buying it. But then a neighbour approached me and said, how about going in with us? So with two, two other neighbours, we actually bought that farm and split it up. So again, that's another form of cooperation. Uh, and we gained 150, hect 150 acres. Uh, that was, I think, 44 hectares of, of arable and 22 hectares, hectares of commercial woodland. Uh, three years later, another neighbour um, suggested that we cooperate with the Run of River Hydro Scheme. And that was one of the benefits of buying the forestry because in this slide that you're looking at now, down in the, the strath there runs a little river. Now, we had no access to that river before we bought that forestry, but having bought the forestry, we also landed up with uh, the bank of a, a small spate river. And this other neighbor said, well, look, I think there's potential to uh, put a hydro scheme in there. So we contacted yet another neighbor because we needed permission to bury the pipe under their land. And at that point, we pulled in SOS. And SOS helped us form a company called Skier Hydro Limited. And we worked for the next 
seven years, I think it was, because these things take an enormous length of time to organize, particularly when you're dealing with consultees such as SEPA and having to do environmental impact assessments, um, deal with all the wildlife people, everything else. It takes ages, plus planning. And it, it literally did take seven years of hard work. Now, there's no way I could have done that without knowing that the arable uh, operations were all going smoothly because we'd uh, got the, the cooperative going. Uh, a few years later, when the, the sort of renewables really took off, um, somebody approached us about putting a 500 kilowatt wind turbine uh, up on some of our hill grazing. You probably saw it in a slide previously. We decided to go for that. And we had intended first to go for a, a joint venture but at the very last minute, we realized that we were going to have some more investment because my son wanted to put up a new uh, grain store. And we also knew that the hydro scheme might come off. So we decided at the very last minute just to accept a rental. And in the end, we did a deal with them that the rental was 17% of the top line. And for no investment, that meant a substantial chunk of annual in income coming in from that one single turbine. Uh, two years later, we decided to go ahead with uh, three and a half thousand ton grain store. Prior to that, I've been drying all the grain through a 1960s Jack Olding in-bin drying system. And my son had said to me there was no way he was going to carry on doing that which meant a lot of shoveling and um, getting down bins and Anyway, he, he wasn't going to do it. So we decided to put up a new grain store uh, with two 600 ton drying floors and two 500 kilowatt biomass boilers. Now, the idea of putting them in was that we, we could set up a district heating system for 10 houses, including our own. And we could also benefit from the RHIs and the FITs, that's the renewable heat incentives and feed-in tariffs that the government were promoting. And if you got in early, they were very, very lucrative. And so we're sitting now with some very substantial payments from uh, government, which are index linked to pay for these, uh, all this investment. And at the very last minute, we put 50 kilowatts of solar panels on the roof to drive the pumps, because we realized the, the pumps to, push the water around the district heating uh, was going to get pretty expensive. So now we've got the 50 kilowatts of solar panels. And even in Scotland, they work quite well these days. And the final renewable business ended up, the, the one we started with ended up the last. And that was the Runner River Hydro uh, Joint Venture. And that eventually what happened was we sold the company to a third party because two, two of our partners didn't want to continue with it. And um, the third party then, we bought shares back in, in the Hydro scheme. So that we're actually 25% owners of uh, the Hydro scheme. And that year, 2016-17, uh, five the, the, the agri-environment scheme came in. So we immediately went into that. And we also started letting ground out for potato growing, again, to support uh, a sort of rotation policy, because we realized we'd been continuous cereals for probably the last 25 years, and we needed to get a rotation built in. So it was perfect. Uh, the five-year agri-environment scheme took about 45 hectares out of production, and then letting 30 to 40 hectares of to potato growers took another um, 30 to 40 hectares out of the the cereal uh, acreage or hectareage. Um, then Airbnb turned up. Um, I never thought Airbnb would work, but my daughter-in-law uh, decided that she could make a go of it. And so she now rents five cottages from the farm business at uh, going rents, uh, which I used to get for tenants, who long-term tenants. And she makes enough money from the Airbnb to make a handsome profit on them. Uh, the first uh, 
uh, biomass boiler system had worked so well, we decided to install a second one, uh, second district heating system, and add another six houses at another farm where the old dryer was. And that now also heats the old dryer, the Jack Olding diesel dryer, so that um, we can now dry all our homegrown seed and new varieties that we're trialing through that system. Uh, and it works far, far better than diesel because you're actually sending dry air uh, through it. Whereas with the diesel, there was a, always a certain amount of moisture that was within in the, the air that you push through. Uh, next slide, please. So what does cooperation mean for our business? Well, it's provided a reliable, efficient service at an affordable price. It's cut our costs dramatically and it's allowed flexibility in both our land use and our business development. Um, without cooperation, we probably wouldn't have enough time to do all these extras and we'd less likely, certainly less likely to have invested in the other business areas. And we still would be fully reliant on arable cropping. And having been more or less 100% reliable on it, less than 60% of our income now comes from arable cropping. Um, Highland land management finally wound up in 2018, but without any hesitation at all, we simply went straight to another neighbour and uh, uh, with a similar farming business, approached them and said, what about cooperating? It really works. And that's what we're doing with now into our third season of cooperating um, with another neighbor. And it's working really well. It's a different model, a much more flexible, loose model, but it, it works quite well. And um, just so you know what that slide is, uh, that's actually our um, green manure from last year. And it's a mixture of red clover, uh, which obviously puts the nitrogen back in the ground, and chicory, which is really deep rooted and breaks up all the pan and, and helps. And it's, it's been a tremendous success. And there's that huge bulk to plow back in to uh, add green manure to the, the soil. So that's well worth doing. Uh, final slide, I think. Yeah, cooperation, it's a bit like a marriage, and I've got quite a bit of experience in that. I think I'm in my 48th year of marriage. Uh, it's got its ups and downs, but undoubtedly the benefits far outweigh the disadvantages. So thank you for listening. And I'll hand on to Caroline. Hector, that was superb. Well done, that was really interesting to listen to. Thank you. Um, I really enjoyed that. So I'm Caroline. I, um, as Kerry said, started um, an agricultural chemical buying group in 2016. I am originally from Ireland, grew up on a farm there, um, schooled there, and then did a cookery course in Southern Ireland, um, which then led on to a ski season and working for cooking agencies in London. And I bagged a cooking job up in Scotland um, and went to Edinburgh, applied to university, got environmental science through the University of Edinburgh, but it was all based at SAC, um, where I met my now husband, Hugh Black, and we live on his family arable farm in the heart of Angus and we're bringing up our five young children there. Um, so when we first got married um, nearly 12 years ago now, I um, started working for Angus Soft Roots um, account managing the Asda Morrisons and co-op accounts. Um, I um, also ran the wholesale markets. Um, so as you can appreciate, Soft Roots has a very short shelf life. Um, it's very much based on um, weather and how much volume comes in depends on, on how sunny or not sunny it's been. Um, so there was loads of negotiation um, between prices every week with the buyers, um, getting into wholesale markets, getting the stuff packed on time, grown in different punnets, getting into depot on time. So there was lots of negotiation um, taking place and it gave me quite a lot of training um, and I learned a huge amount in those two years when I worked for Angus Soft Roots, um, which was great. So um, if I could move on to the next slide, 
Thanks, or thank you, Seamus. Sorry, keep going. <laughs> thank you. Um, you could just put all of those up if that's okay on that slide. So, um, so why start a buying group? So after um, I got pregnant with the first set of twins, I stopped working for Angus Soft Roots and started buying inputs for the family farm. Um, and I was quickly realizing that with just buying for one farm, it was very hard to negotiate on price as much as I tried. Um, and Hugh had a very good discussion group with some of his peers. And I suggested that he start a buying group with these peers um, and he'd have a far better negotiating power to try and get some better prices to reduce inputs and, and increase margins. And he quickly suggested that I should do it. Um, so I applied to Scottish Enterprise to their rural leadership scheme, um, their rural leadership program even, and they were absolutely fantastic. It was a, a great program. It was 12 days um, over one winter and um, they really pushed you to set out your goals, your objectives and really um, put everything into place and help you make everything you needed to happen happen. So um, in 2016, I started the buying group. Um, I decided to start the buying group. I then spoke to our local independent agronomist who we were using on the farm um, and he just thought that this was exactly what Angus was needing and was really supportive and completely behind the group um, or the idea of it. So he introduced me to his um, his agronomy group that he ran within Angus and introduced me to them and let me kind of put my, my idea across and, um, and 11 growers locally decided that um, they would trust me uh, very willingly and um, we started the buying group. So that was um, in 2016 and we've now grown very organically and um, have just over 20 growers and just under 6,000 hectares. Um, so next slide, please. I'm going to put all the, all the um, information up on the slide. Thanks, Seamus. Um, so traditionally, um, and um, Hugh used to do this also in, in some areas and some of the um, people who joined the buying group to begin with, um, they maybe didn't necessarily look for the best price. A lot of it was, oh, I need to spray tomorrow and I need this, I need to go and collect it. And we'd just go into the local depot, pick up the chemical, bring it back to the farm and spray it. And it was very easy, it worked well, um, but they didn't know how much they paid for it. They didn't shop around and they weren't necessarily getting the best price um, by doing it that way. Um, I think traditionally, Farmers are trustworthy, they build up relationships with people and they honor those relationships. And um, sometimes, you know, sometimes it's, it can cost you, I think, um, in some areas. But um, so in traditionally distributors have their agronomists and the agronomy team would come into the farm. Um, they would um, prescribe for your your crops, depending on what disease pressures you have, and um, sell you the chemical and deliver it on farm and invoice you directly. Um, and then you've got the independent um, agronomist model where um, you employ somebody completely separate and not affiliated with a distributor and um, get them to apply exact or to prescribe exactly what you need um, for your crops and they then let you go and price around or buy from whatever distributor you prefer. Um, if you are pricing around again, you're, you're caught with the same thing I was caught with um, that you're just trying to negotiate for one farm, um, which doesn't always let you get um, the best price. Um, so if you could go on to the next slide, please, Shana. Um, so the buying group model, um, so how I run it is um, the independent agronomist will still um, go into the farmer, give them the prescription that they need, and then they give that prescription to me. I have either already um, priced what they needed because I'm talking quite a lot with the agronomists, with the distributors, I've priced in advance of the season um, just to be as ready and prepared as possible um, with 
I keep pricing throughout the season to make sure everything's up to date. Um, so I then get the prescription and I look at whatever distributor um, could be from five different ones um, and has the best um, price and I get that order put in and get it delivered on farm. The distributor still invoices direct to the farmer and then I put um, a percentage fee on that and that gets invoiced along with the agreed price to the farmer um, so they can double check it. Uh, I actually just even ran an exercise the other day there was one farmer one order four products and in those four products there was a difference of over 200 pounds so it really does um, you know really does pay to shop around if that farmer was putting in 10, 10 different orders um, you know it soon racks up you know the savings are, are really good. Um, and it also, um, funnily in France, actually, they're, they're slightly changing their model. And I think um, a lot of the EU will start to go this way, if not have started already. Um, as you'll maybe all be aware, you know, people are wanting to spray less, people are looking at their soils more and more um, micronutrients and um, trying to um, reduce chemical spraying and in France they've actually gone a step ahead and um, from January the first this year they've actually put in in law that you're not allowed um, distributors are not allowed to have agronomists on their books and um, that all agronomy has to be separate to distribution and they were doing this in the hope that they would save um, 50 percent of sprays being applied um, on farms so it's quite substantial um, for a goal and I don't know if they've actually achieved that yet um, but they reckoned that this was you know one of the ways that would help them with unnecessary spraying um, so quite interesting that that is the model they've chosen um, to go with to try and reduce sprays to cut out the agronomists working for distributors um, so if I could go on to the next slide, please. Um, again, if you could bring everything up. Um, so what have we achieved in the five years? So um, the company has, has grown organically through word of mouth, um, which I think says a lot. Um, we've maintained um, all the original growers who have started with us. Um, I've developed relationships with distribution, with agronomists, um, with clients, and um, I've made savings for everybody so far, which is really good. Um, you'll probably laugh, but I do rate it. Like if you could bring your wife out for a meal or, you know, away for a weekend or going on a ski holiday, if I can, you know, if I can save that money for every farmer, then I'm absolutely delighted. Um, and just also to say, which I know um, isn't usual, but a farmer joined our group last year. He completely changed his model. He bought traditionally from one big distributor and they supplied the agronomy team. Um, and he has quite a lot of cereals, but by changing his he completely changed his um, his his outlook and went with the independent agronomist and I bought his chemicals but based on what the independent agronomist um, prescribed for his farm he actually saved £100,000 last year just on his cereals and he's a massive um, cereal farmer so you know that is quite a substantial saving um, obviously that doesn't happen every day but um, you know it is something to to look at that it is worth looking around it's worth you know trying to reduce all those inputs and looking at how you can and this is this is one area um, that I focused on that you know to try and get the best price possible um, buying most cost effectively um, and trying to get any deals possible um, so can we go on to the next slide please um, so challenges, so um, there were probably a few challenges, um, even initially with the farming group I pitched to, um, you know, farmers like calling their distributor, like discussing things with their agronomists, so, you know, having the trust to kind of jump into a new system that they haven't been used to before, or haven't done before, um, was a big thing to ask. Um, and um, then also 
there was a distributor who wasn't quite keen on on pricing the group and um, just our aims didn't quite align you know i'm trying to get the best possible price and they're trying to promote agronomy and um you know sales trying to trying to make the best possible margin so we're not quite aligning yet to supply um but we still communicate about it um and then also i love getting a deal i love saving money i love um processing all the orders but i'm not necessarily Really great sending out my invoices um so that's a challenge that i'm definitely overcoming and um getting better at all the time and um then what's uh, sorry next slide what's next for the group um i hope it continues to grow organically um and um grow hectare, hectares and be able to um, maybe diversify into other inputs like fertilizers um and also um, just build relationships with different distributors and you know hopefully one day even manufacturers um so that's 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 my little buying group um i'm very proud of it and i'm very happy that um that i've been able to make it work um that i've been able to help farmers um save money and take the time of pricing everything and wait prices to come back and decide what ones they're going to go for. Um, I just take all that stress away, hopefully for them and help them and let them get on with um, more important things. So thank you so much for listening um, and pass it back to you, Kerry. Thank you so much, Caroline. Anna, Hector, Caroline, what an absolutely wonderful way to spend a Tuesday evening. Um, you were all absolutely fantastic. Um, and I'm sure that we uh, are going to have quite a lot of questions to round off our session. Um, just a quick note to the attendees, um, if you would like to, you still have time to post a question. We'll keep that open for about another five minutes. Um, if you have anything specifically you would like to ask our speakers again, please do just pop in the Q&A box who I'm directing it towards. Next slide, please, Seamus. Um, just before we get on to the Q&A, because I know that some of you may decide to slink off early, I just wanted to ask you to please uh, complete the feedback survey that you will get on completion of this webinar. So that's feedback for our speakers, which allows us to thank them and tell them what a great job that they did. But it's also feedback for the Farm Advisory Service so that we can continue to put on free events and webinars like this. And um, it literally takes two minutes. I think there's about four questions in it. And everyone who completes the survey is entered into a prize draw to win 50 pounds worth of vouchers, either for damn delicious or for Battlefield Bakery. Um, okay, uh, thanks Seamus, next slide. We're going to go to the Q&A. So um, the first question that we've got here is for Hector. And Hector, the question is, what first inspired you to look at or think about cooperation? Well, uh, it was actually a very eccentric um, but very clever uh, friend of my father's who, when I was just a young boy, really, uh, told me about a movement in Spain, in the Basque country, called Mondragon. Now, I don't know if any of you have heard of Mondragon, but if you haven't, have a look. Google Mondragon, that's M-O-N-D-R-A-G-O-N, because it was started by a Catholic priest in 1956, as I think an educational workers cooperative and it now has 81,000 employees, it owns banks, it owns factories and it's been a fantastic success and I always felt that maybe the Highlands would be an ideal place to replicate it. We haven't done it yet but there's always a chance so Mondragon was the, the initial uh, reason why I thought of cooperating. That's really interesting. Uh, I've popped that into the chat for attendees. So if you did want to copy and paste it out of there, you can have a quick Google. Thank you so much for that answer, Hector. Um, I've got a question here from uh, a 
an anonymous attendee. It's for all of the panel. So, um, Anna, I'm going to put it to you first. <laughs> um, why do some for farmers not cooperate? Um, I guess in most cases, they probably think that they don't need to, that there's not a need. Um, they maybe don't understand um, how to how to start that that relationship, how to have that initial conversation. Um, but as I said, you know, without it sounding too much of a, a plug for SUS, that's absolutely what we're here for. We're here to help have that initial conversation and to talk through any ideas because as you've heard from Hector and Caroline, the benefits that working together can have far outweigh that probably scary first conversation. So, you know, in my mind, that that's the only thing that could hold someone back from, you know, making that first step. Thanks, Anna. Um, Caroline, why do you think some farmers don't cooperate? Um, it's a good question. Um, I think historically, there was more cooperation and I think generally generationally that's maybe stepped out a little bit um but I think farmers are so busy you know and I think it's sometimes hard to maybe look at it from you know Hector's obviously done an amazing job to you know step outside look at it and see how they can make it work and I know farmers are doing that all the time but I think it's you know they're so busy and then to have the conversation, the initial conversation, and then, you know, obviously to get SAOS um, would be fantastic, but I suppose it's a process that, you know, needs thought, needs time, you know, how they need to probably run it through in their heads, how it's all going to work um, to start with. And, um, you know, I suppose it's, um, people can be protective of what they have as well. Um, but I suppose the more the more that it's promoted, more that it's talked about, um, and you know the benefits of it. I mean, it was incredible to hear Hector's um, Hector's talk on how well it, his has has run. So hopefully, it will be something that you know might step up in the future. Uh, with that answer, Hector, can I ask you um, your opinion on the question, but also possibly from your own experience things that you you may have learned from your previous experiences that could potentially put somebody off cooperating yeah well i i think we all have an in inbuilt independence in us and it's mm. that initial thought that we might lose control and but once you realize that you're actually not losing total control you then find that it's it's really quite therapeutic because you've got somebody to share all the concerns and worries that you may have um i'm going to slightly turn to my crib sheet here because i won't remember all the things that uh, uh, have occurred but I, I think what i would like to say is if you're a control freak uh, and some people are, it's not probably for you. I think you've got to be prepared to give and relax a little bit. Um, and I've touched on communication. Communication is absolutely essential. And that's something we learned very much. Uh, make sure that only one person gives the orders uh, and organizes the work, because that can be complicated if you all keep putting your oar in. Uh, so you can start that at the very beginning um, if you've very exacting standards, be prepared to drop them a little bit, certainly at the beginning, because you can't, uh, you know your land, your partners don't, and it will take a bit of time for them to bed in uh, and realise how your land is worked. And you've got to explain that to them and um, realise that, you know, the things aren't done exactly on time and they aren't done exactly as you want them but gradually you'll build that experience up um so yeah don't expect everything to happen exactly when you want it it doesn't uh but there are ways around that and certainly at the beginning of our cooperation we've always said if we're running behind hand bring in contractors and we both pay for them so that it, it's a shared cost uh, and we have on occasions done that. It, it, we've brought extra combining capacity in when the weather's not good. And um, then we share the cost of that and it, 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 everyone benefits. Um, 
the other one, if you have employees, especially ones that have been with you for a long time, carry them along because it's it's essential. It's just as strange for them as it is for you working with somebody else. And I think you have to remember that and um, do that. But there are several more, but possibly I'll leave it at that, Kerry, and maybe it'll come up later. But that's just a flavor of the things. I think those are um, really valuable pieces of advice and really valuable lessons learned. Um, Caroline, can I can I reflect and ask you if you were to give somebody your top tips and advice on um, setting up a, a buying group um, or a cooperative, what would your advice be? Yeah, I, I think I would definitely um, echo Anna and Hector's advice with communication. I think communication is key in so many ways. Communication with um, with the client, with the distributor, with the manufacturer, with distribution, agronomist. Um, and I think you have to build these relationships, build trust. And the more you can, can communicate, you know, the, the better, I think the better the flow of the company. And, um, you know, I would also say to keep it simple. I think um, try not to make things too complicated. The simpler something can be, um, more efficient and more chance of it um you know working out and i would also say that that would be my advice um for starting a cooperative fantastic we have caroline uh, um a question i think from somebody who might be interested in your contact details uh, we have a question here is your buying group only available for certain regions such as angus can growers out with angus join Yes, so um, currently we um, buy for um, farmers in Angus, in Fife and in Perthshire, um, but it's not, it's not held to just those places either. Um, it can be from, from wherever. And um, would it be okay if I were to share your email address in the chat box? Yes, thank you. <laughs> No problem. So we'll we'll do that for the attendees before we um, close off today. Um, okay, the next question here is for Hector. And it is, could you please tell us about how your inspiration with Mondragon has led you to make decisions, i.e. your diversification? Um, I mean, Mondragon was really the inspiration for cooperation, uh, but the diversification was, I just felt that agriculture was not going to be sustainable. Um, margins were just too tight and I couldn't see how I could improve them dramatically. Uh, and I just felt we had to get away from mainstream farming. Um, I was worried about the potential for Brexit. I was worried about the fact that we're so far north, our markets are, are in the south. We were also uh, very much dependent on the malting barley trade. And so we were really dealing with one commodity and I was just a little bit concerned. And that's when we started looking around. And okay, Providence is always useful and you know, we were just lucky that chunk of woodland came up. And actually, I would be suggesting to a group, any group of farmers, you should be looking at forming a forestry cooperative because you're going to need those trees to reduce your carbon footprint. Now, just by chance, I didn't know about carbon footprints when I bought timber, but it happens that we've landed fairly lucky there in that we've got more or less equal amount of timber as do we have agricultural land and I would personally if I was a group of farmers getting together I would look at buying a forest in order to sink your carbon footprint into that and then you can carry on farming in an efficient manner but that's the sort of thing that you you have to be thinking out of the box that's some brilliant out of the box thinking and uh, we have a, another question here from somebody else who I think is looking to think outside of the box asking 
what, where do you think the future of cooperation is specifically for the agrochemical sector? So Caroline, I'm going to pose that question to you. Um, yes, well, um, the future of the agrochemical business and cooperation, I think it's definitely something that's going to be more prevalent in the sense um, that if you look at France and their model, um, there's also um, the, is it the far, farm to fork um, in the EU, they're wanting to reduce the application of chemicals. So they're going to be looking um, at different ways to do that. I think it's harder and harder, you know, for farmers, there's chemicals um, getting banned and getting revoked the whole time. And it's to really look at exactly what you need, look at, you know, are you overspraying your farm? Do you have any weeds on your farm? You know, if you think you're overspraying, you know, how can you reduce this? What can you do, you know, thinking outside the box to be able to do that? And I think if you can collaborate and, you know, buy with another farm, you know, join up with a group of farmers, you know, join my group. Um, I just feel that if, you know, together you can be just so much stronger in your buying power. And I think maybe, I don't know if it's um, generationally as well, you know, there's, um, there's loads of different groups now, you know, there's... Um, all the machinery rings are amazing at collaboration. And I definitely think it's something that people should be looking at. Historically, I think it's, you know, it's hard to hard to change. It's also mindset change. Um, but I also think the more people can discuss it, talk about it, and you know, the more people can open up to it um, and look at how they could do it within their farming business. Um, so yeah, I'm hoping the future is bright for us. <laughs> Um, I'm going to round up the Q&A just now. Um, Anna, we have one final question in for you, which is, I'm interested in having a conversation and finding out more. What is my next step? How do I get in touch with SAOS? Yeah, absolutely. Um, all our contact details are on the website. Um, feel free to, to share my email address. Um, my colleagues Robert and, and Jim are going to be uh, leading on the next two sessions uh, of, of the series. Um, so contact, contact any of us about um, any idea that you have. M more than happy to chat that through with you. Um, absolutely fantastic. Thank you so much. I have thoroughly enjoyed collaborating um, with all three of you. This has been wonderful. Thank you very, very much for your time. Um, thank you to all of our attendees for your uh, attention. Thank you for your questions. Um, we will uh, drop Anna's email address and Hector's email address into the chat alongside Caroline's and we'll leave that open for one to two minutes so that you can nip in there and copy and paste the details that you need. Um, all that's left for me to do is to say thank you very much and good night and feel free to leave the webinar when you're ready.